This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Good afternoon, everyone. Can, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. You can, thanks, because I'm not sure this one's working, but I think this has a mic somewhere in the system here. Lovely to see you all here on such an appalling day, um, and hopefully the the damage is more than just to the trees and the environment around us, and there's no human catastrophes. Um, I believe the public transport system has been affected by power outages, so we may have some people who will be joining later. But it's wonderful to see such a very big audience to hear our guest, a distinguished guest visitor from the University of Arizona, um, uh, who, um, about whom I'll mention a few words uh, in a second. Um, I have to deal with some of the um, housekeeping arrangements. Before that, um, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the tradi traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, and particularly to note that we at the University of Melbourne, especially in our schools um, uh, within the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry, Health Sciences, have a particularly strong commitment to Indigenous health and to closing the gap and to involving our Indigenous uh, academics in, uh, in a really meaningful way in doing that. So this beautiful lecture theatre is part of an extremely uh, beautiful building above us as well and a fantastic venue uh, for, um, for us here today, um, our speaker. And this is part of the Magania Distinguished Fellowship um, series and um, there'll be uh, perhaps some more discussion about that uh, later on as well. Um, I'd, I'd really uh, like first to uh, just deal with the housekeeping bits and pieces, which are somewhere here. Uh, phones off, please, including my own, so just make sure I do that. Secondly, um, we are going to try and record the whole session, including the questions, so there will be this microphone, which I'm not sure is working, so maybe while the presentation is happening, then your questions get recorded as well. And so those who can't be here today will also be able to benefit later. Um, the um, exit points and bathrooms and so on, I haven't got specific information on, but I'm sure they're through the back and the exits are marked here uh, on the walls. So um, it, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Matthias Mayer from the University of Arizona in the United States. Matthias is going to speak to us today about um, quotidian psychology or how the little things in life matter for our lives. Quotidian is a fancy word for everyday or mundane, as I'm sure he's going to explain to us, and is fundamental to uh, his own scientific observations and the contributions he's made. Matthias is a social or personality psychologist interested in how psychological processes affect health and well-being. Methodologically, he uses ambulatory assessment methods to study everyday experiences and behaviour and has helped pioneer novel methods of ecologic data collection, most prominently electronically activated recorder or EAR methods. Matthias is Professor of Psychology at the University of Arizona and he also holds what is recorded here, Matthias's courtesy appointments, I think we call them adjunct appointments um, in this university, uh, in the Department of Communications, in the Division of Family Studies and Human Development and also at the Arizona Cancer Centre. It's a wonderful opportunity to us, for all of us today, uh, to hear um, something about Matthias's work and its importance for health and wellbeing. Matthias, welcome. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a great pleasure and honour to be here in, in Melbourne, to be here at the University and to be here in this, this um, beautiful venue and thank you so much for coming. And I want to use this opportunity to also acknowledge that I'm a guest here, for which I'm, I'm very grateful, and I want to acknowledge that I'm a guest on the land of the Burundi people. And over the next weeks that I am here, I, I look forward to learning more about um, the culture and the history of the Aboriginal people in Australia. I also want to acknowledge that a lot of the research that I will be talking about today um, was conducted on indigenous land in Arizona, um, and um, the University of Arizona resides on the land of the Tohono O'odham and the Kaskoyaki um, people. 
So I want to use the chance to pay my respect to the traditional custodians of um, the lands here and their both lands. Thank you very much. The title of my talk is um, Quotidian Psychology. I am, I'm a psychologist by training, a social psychologist, and um, so I, I wanted to open this talk um, with the definition of psychology. What is psychology? Psychology is the study of mind and behavior to understand and enhance um, behavior in various settings of human activity. This is the official definition of the American Psychological Association. And when you look at this definition, well, it's about understanding and enhancing behavior in various settings of human activity. The question that this prompts in me, the question that I have, what kind of behavior and what kind of setting are we talking about? Are we talking about the big behavior and the big settings of life, the big stages of life, or the little behaviors and the little stages of life? Um, the general paradigm in psychology, one could call it a, a critical life event psychology. Um, and in this um, critical life event psychology, life flows along, and along with life come a series of, of critical life events. So for example, um, you fall in love, you at some point take on a job, some people get married, some people decide to get into parenthood. Um, in some cases, there may be um, the dissolution of the marriage. You, um, at some point, illness happens, a chronic illness, an acute illness, life-changing illness, a death of a loved one. So there's lots and lots of, of critical life events. I should point out that these are, of course, not normative life events. Not everybody goes through all of them. Um, but over the course of a lifetime, we accumulate our share of these critical life events. And I think it's fair to say that these are the, the events. These are the events that historically psychology has honed in on. These are the events that psychology has studied in terms of how they affect us, how they affect our well-being, and how we, we cope with them. So for example, um, people have looked at how well-being changes um, from before to after critical life events. This is some research um, that was um, summarizes uh, probably about a decade or two of well-being research. And here you have uh, a number of critical life events. And these are trajectories. Um, time zero is, is when the critical event happened. These are the years before. These are the year, years, years after. So for example, um, people get happy around, around marriage, and then it kind of adjusts over time again. Um, <laughs> you have widowhood obviously has a, has a very strong effect. You see that, interestingly enough, it, and, and reasonably so. Um, uh, well-being drops actually right before the before way before the event already, and it, it picks up maybe not entirely, and and same with divorce you have a decline. Um, the the nadir of of well-being actually is about a year before the actual divorce event, and so you can really learn a lot about the normative changes that people go through, um, or the typical the, the the standard the default changes that people um, go through in these events. On the other side we have. Um, critical life events that people do not readily habituate to, um, so where you, you have some residue um, after the fact. So for example, employment has a very strong effect, and, and even um, if participants took on another employment at the end, you, you tend to have a residual effect, um, and you also have um, a decline in well-being. This is very important research, and you, and you can learn a lot about that. What you don't see in this is that behind these trajectories are, are hundreds and hundreds of people. And what you don't see is kind of the, the variability, the idiosyncrasy that you also have behind those trajectories. Another um, very popular and very um, timely um, research topic is personality development. Personality was, was once assumed to be um, set in plaster after the age of 30. After the age of 30, personality is what it is, and that's what that's the cards you dealt with, and this is what you have to work with. Uh, we now know that personality can change over the period of a lifetime, and it changes considerably. And we're studying what are the things that change personality. And, and what comes to mind right away is um, critical life events. So this is a very recent paper from 2019, uh, where a group of researchers try to summarize what we know at this point about um, personality change in relation to critical life events. And it starts right away in the abstract. Theory and research have emphasized the impact of life events on personality trait change. So how I change in who I am as a function of a life event. Typically in psychology, these things are studied with the so-called big five, which are the major five personality dimensions um, that, that um, underlying a lot of smaller and more narrow traits. And these are um, conscientiousness, 
kind of an imaginative, insightful, and, and, and um, nature with having broad interests, conscientiousness, the C, um, being organized, thoughtful, and planful, extroversion, being outgoing, um, energetic, and assertive, um, agreeableness, being sympathetic, kind, and affectionate, and neurotic, being um, high in negative emotions, like tenseness, at a tense, being tense, moody, and anxious. So when you look at this, you can um, cluster life events along two um, dimensions. So this is, uh, Freud already called it, these are kind of the, the work events and these are love events. So work and love are kind of, kind of the big two dimensions of psychology. And here we have going to school, college, taking on a job, unemployment, retirement, and over here, um, the romantic events, falling in love, marrying, parenthood, divorce, and, and, and widowhood. Again, not normative. And when you look at the research, um, it's, it is very interesting. So for example, going to college, um, college changes people's personality considerably. And it, it leads in the majority of people to a social um, maturation. So you have increases in, in openness and conscientiousness, extroversion, and neuroticism to, to lead to uh, become better um, contributor to society and, and, and acquire social maturity. Um, what you see is taking on a job increases um, conscientiousness of plan for organized behavior and as taking on a job increases it, so um, does losing a job decrease it? Um, and, and it's probably not surprising that unemployment also um, tends to go with an increase in anxiety and neuroticism and retirement uh, kind of seems to loosen the reins on our need to be planned for all the time we can let go and we can become a little less conscientious. Um, on the other side, in, in, in the romantic domain, uh, falling in love um, creates a feeling of, of, of social um, confidence. We become more outgoing, more extroverted, and calmer and more positive in, in our outlook on average. Um, marriage, on the other hand, parenthood, and, and so also divorce, um, have the opposite effect. They kind of pull us inward. We become more introverted, more, more quiet, and um, parenthood potentially increasing neuroticism. Um, widowhood, in the end, not clear, but sometimes you find it. So here you see a number of, of question marks. What are these question marks? And, and the story that I've told you so far is a little too clean. So, so what you, why you see all these, these question marks here, and the question marks indicate that, well, one study finds it, another one doesn't. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the studies, a lot of differences um, between the studies. And, and, and again, why do you find those? Well, because these are different samples. The samples have different compositions. There are different people behind them. And there's, again, a lot of variability. So what this, as, as useful as it has been and as interesting, I, I, I'm, I really am a big fan of the personality development research, as interesting as it has been, what this critical life event approach blurs is that from a measurement perspective, life events tend to be bad proxy variables. Um, they are not the real thing. They, they reflect something, but they're not the real thing you really want to study. Um, why is this so? This is so because life events impact different people differently. Um, there's large variability around these average trajectories. And, and sometimes you find even very different trajectories. So f some people, for example, um, have a relatively flat line. They seem unaffected by major life events, such as um, the death of a loved one or such as losing an employment. And a lot of that goes into the question of resiliency. Some others have a very quick response and go back. Some others have a prolonged response. So there's lots of variability. Life events also impact people on different time scales. Um, some people have kind of a year of mourning afterwards. Some have a prolonged grief disorder. It goes on for a very long time. Um, and some people have even an anticipated response that, that um, before the event, you, you, you see already um, responses. In addition to that, and, and even more relevant to, to the topic today, um, life events do not only exert what one could call a macro level impact. They are actually, they're, they're, this most serious active ingredient is the micro level impact on people's daily thoughts, feelings, and behavior. So if you take the case of bereavement, for example, um, there can be and often is a macro level impact. So for example, if the family loses substantial income, then at the macro level that puts a very different situation on the family. On the other hand, um, the, the biggest source of, of, of sadness and of the mourning happens from not being able to talk to the loved one on a daily basis, feeling the burning desire to share something and not being able to, feeling an incredible sadness that, that plans that one had doesn't happen. And these things happen on a daily basis. So a lot of times, the effect really happens at the micro level of 
the, the things that happen on a daily basis. And last but not least, um, life events also do not hit people as, as was displayed really at, at this, um, in the graphs at, at time zero. This assumes that people just wait, the life event happens, and then you see the responses. This is not how it is. P people have busy lives. People have um, their habitual lives, and, and the trauma happens in the midst of that and happens in the midst of their flow of normal lives and changes things, but also people still have to deal with the things that anyway are going on. Um, and um, from the, because of that, um, Kenneth Craig, who was an, an ecological psychologist at UC Berkeley, said, perhaps our scientific tendency to neglect the ordinary, humdrum aspects of daily life reflects some limitation in the conceptual systems we have formulated. Lives are lived day by day, one day at a time, from day to day, day in, day out, lives as we, day after day, day in, day out, lives as we experience and observe them are inherently quotidian. So it's this day in, day out perspective that I think we need to open ourselves up as psychologists and take serious as a, a major source of, of psychological information. So I want to propose that we complement the traditional approach with an alternative approach. And, and you could call this um, quotidian psychology or, or everyday psychology. Um, the idea being that we, we focus on the things that happen on a daily basis. Egon Brunswick was a um, perception researcher in the field and also an ecological perception researcher. And he said it with, in, the, in the clearest way that, that one could that psychology tends to operate under a double standard. Um, in psychology, we know, we are trained from, from the first class on, that we need to apply sampling theory to our subjects. On the other hand, we fail to do so when we, in the study of our objects. So he was a, a perception researcher, so for him it was the perceptual objects. But really, we're talking about the stimuli in the environment, um, the situations in, in the environment more broadly. So what does this mean? So, we know when we're studying a phenomenon, we need to, as psychologists, we study with human subjects, we, we recruit participants. We sample participants from a target population. We have a target population in mind. We sample from the target population because we intend to generalize our finding back to the population. At the same time, says Egan Brunswick, we have a second random factor that we need to consider in our designs. We don't only want to generalize to a population. We also want to generalize to an ecology. So in the same way that we sample participants from, from populations in order to generalize back to the population, we need to sample situations from underlying ecologies in order to be able to say that this finding likely applies to this particular ecology. And. Um, one of the first studies that, that really took this serious and, and, and um, was very influential in bringing attention to the everyday conduct was a study that was conducted by Barker and Wright um, in, in the late 40s that was published as a book, One Boy's Day, A Specimen Record of Behavior. May I get a quick show of hands who, who knows this book by any chance? It's not a very well-known book, but it was a seminal piece of work in the area of ecological psychology. What Barker and Wright did um, was they assembled a team of observers, and the observers um, went into the house of a family, and they observed seven-year-old Raymond Birch for one full day, from morning to end. It was April 26, 1949, in Oskaloosa, Kansas. And the idea behind that was to say, we need to stop bringing participants to the laboratory. We need to begin to bring the laboratory to participants. We need to escape the confines of the psychological laboratory that are artificial and, and, and study psychology where it actually happens, within the ordinary contextual influence of the life. The, the product of this investigation was a comprehensive writ written record of 422 pages that literally document what exactly um, Raymond Birch did from 7 a.m. in the morning to 8.32 at night. So you, you read things like this. Um, at 7 o'clock, for example, 7.02, um, his mother asked, do you want to put this undershirt on or do you want to wear the one that you have on already? Raymond sleepily muttered something in reply. His mother left the room and went into the kitchen. 7.03, he pulled on his right sock. He picked up his left sh uh, tennis shoe and put it on. He laced his left shoe 
with slow deliberation, looking intently at the shoe as he worked steadily until he had it on lace. 704, he put on the right shoe. As you can see, this is probably not the most exciting book you will ever pick up. <laughs> um, but we cannot underestimate the importance that this first piece of, of documentation of, of daily behavior had, had in the field. Um, obviously, the, um, the, the, eight the eight observers have tons to do to write down everything, to document everything. So obviously, the next step would be to, to record, to, re to actually record people's days. And this is what Kenneth Craig did um, in, in the late 80s and, and early 90s with what he coined live day analysis. So he followed very much in the footsteps of Barker and Wright and um, was inspired by the fact that at that time, in the 90s, um, um, we had what, what he refers to as portable miniature video cameras. These were the things that you actually carry on your shoulder. Um, and, and, and so he assembled a team of, of videographers that um, followed Lorna Dodge um, for one entire day on December 4th, 1990, um, around her, her errands and, and work. Um, in Berkeley and produced a comprehensive audio and video record of, of her day. Um, this is, of course, a major advance because um, now we don't have to um, rely on the things that we, that we noticed, that we caught, could caught attention, but we have a permanent record that we can um, then analyze after the fact. Still, um, obviously, the major limitation is we, we go about studying psychology one case at a time. And so um, what we wanted to do in my laboratory, we wanted to scale up from um, and quotidian N of one methods to um, sorry, a little too fast, to um, a method where we can analyze larger groups of people. And, and, and the method that, that we have developed over the last 20 years is the so-called ear method, the electronically activated recorder, and we chose this word because it makes a nice acronym because it's really the, the researcher's ear that, that, that follows the participant um, around over the course of the day. As you see, um, when we started in the last millennium, um, it was one of those uh, micro cassette recorders um, that we had to sort of wire, wires to, and the participants had to flip their tape after one day because the 45 um, minute tape was, was full. So it was, it was a good amount of um, logistic work. We then switched to digital records. That was a major upgrade because now we could actually have timestamps, objective timestamps. And at this point, we, we have um, an app for that. Yes, there's an app for that, and you can download it um, from the Google Play Store. The idea has remained all the same over the 20 years. What, what we do is we give participants an audio recorder initially an analog, now digital, and say, would you mind wearing this and going about your day? You really don't have to worry about anything else. Wear the device whenever you can. Obviously, don't wear it when you can't wear it or when you don't want to wear it, um, but try to wear it as much as possible. It's very important, oops, let me stay here. <laughs> it's, very, it's very important um, that in these kind of studies, you bring the participant into the study. Um, we tell participants that if they don't wear the device and, and they bring it back and we listen to it a few months later, we wouldn't know so the participants is, is released from the study and, and, and so there's anyway no consequences. So we rely on the participants to understand why we're doing this. So we explain participants that we have no interest to intrude into their privacy whatsoever. We're not privacy intruders. We're accuracy seekers. We want to know the kind of things that are very difficult to remember, to answer honestly and accurately in the questionnaire. So if I ask you today, how many minutes have you spent talking today? Even if you wanted, even if you had the highest motivation to give me the best answer, you couldn't. Why not? Because this is not how our mind works. This is not important information for our, for our mind. It's not saying. So um, we tell participants, but it matters. So this is the kind of information that we want to get. But very importantly, we only want to get the information that you feel comfortable with, if there's anything you don't like, you can review, you have an opportunity to review your sound files and you can delete any file, um, no questions asked. So with this procedure, what we get is essentially an acoustic diary, an acoustic journal of a, day, of a person's day as it naturally unfolds. We record for 30 seconds, so, so uh, small sound bites, about five times an hour, so we get between 70 to 90 sound files in a day. Um, to give you a bit of a flavor of, of what you get, I brought two sound files. Um, this one here is, um, is 
social life in, in a major American metropolitan city. No. Let me see whether this works. <laughs> So what you see, this is not even 30 seconds, this is cut together for presentation purposes. There's a lot of information contained in that. But what do we hear? We hear the person is outside, there's cars in the background, um, the person is walking on a street and, and um, singing, so, so we would probably agree, most of us would say, well, the person is in a pretty good mood. And I think there's another person in the, in the background. So a lot of psychologically interesting information. But, of course, there's more to life than just walking on a, on, a, on a street, so do we also capture the more emotional aspects of life? So here's, a, here's a, an example of emotional life um, from one of our studies. That's why I thought it was okay. I it's okay. No, I didn't see Mom do it. I didn't see Mom do it. I said, Mom, should I set the cruise control at 80 all the way home? She's like, that's fine. And if she says anything different, it's a lie. Because you don't ever test my memory. My memory is perfect. Any memory researchers here? Uh, uh, so I, I play the sound file well because it's a nice sound file, but I also play the sound file because I think it shows very nicely that people habituate to wearing them, that people talk pretty normally. Do we find cases where people censor themselves? Absolutely. But, but over the course of a day, people habituate to it. Um, we actually even have data on that, so about the first couple of hours, people are very mindful um, of, of whether or not they're recorded. And then a busy day goes on, and, 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 and things happen, and you forget about it for much of the time. And you know, you can review it in the back, you can review it at the end, so, um, so there's no need to worry. So we, um, this is kind of anecdotal evidence um, that people habituate and people don't mind wearing it. We also collect empirical evidence, and across many studies, we know that people are obviously aware of it, um, just like I was aware that I, that I was carrying um, this microphone kind of attached to my, if you have a, a little recording device attached, um, but people don't mind um, wearing it much, um, and they, um, it doesn't change their, their behavior in, in critical ways, and it doesn't change their, their days. It doesn't uh, impede on their days a lot. So um, we've done by now a number of studies. We call it the Sounds of Social Life Project. Um, we've done studies with um, different clinical populations, arthritis patients, cancer patients, depressed patients. We've done studies with children here with, together with... Um, Professor Alizic from, from um, University of Melbourne, um, and we're currently engaged, we did a study with recently divorced adults, and we're currently doing a study um, where we look at adolescents who had been hospitalized for suicidal thought and behavior and are returning to the family to study the role that family environments play in, in adjustment to this situation. So really a broad array of different, uh, of different populations. What kind of information do we get from these years on files? Um, we typically extract two sources of information. We extract um, the environment that people find themselves in, the social environment, and, and there we, we, we extract information about the location. Is this inside? Is it outside? Is it in a private setting, a public setting? And admittedly, obviously, we're pretty, pretty um, crude with this information. We don't have any GPS information. That's obviously much more fine-grained. We extract information about activities. Is the TV in the background, music in the background? Um, is the person maybe at a service in church um, or going out? Um, we extract information about interactions. Um, is the person alone with another person in a dyadic, in a group setting, or uh, maybe on the phone? And then we extract what the person is doing in a certain context, and the conversations that, that the person has. And there we focus on what the person's conversation is about and how the person is interacting. So um, content and style in conversation. So um, people vary in what they talk about, um, but people also vary quite a bit in, in how they say things. Some people have a very cognitive language, a very abstract language. Some are very emotional, experiential language. Some people swear a lot, others don't. We actually have some interesting findings on that. Um, and some people um, use a lot of I, 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 first person singular pronouns, whereas others use a lot of we, you, and, and things like that. All these things um, we, we extract and, and we find very interesting. Very importantly, um, all of this is handmade with good care in our laboratory. 
sometimes people ask, so how do you extract this all automatically? Um, well, we're not quite there. Maybe we get there at some point, but at the moment, this is good old coding. So we have groups of research assistants who code um, over long periods of time. A typical study takes us years, and, and so we extract this information. The next question, the question is, well, when you develop a methodology, particularly when you develop a methodology that's pretty labor intensive, you, you ought to ask yourself, why are you doing this? What, what do you add by that? So what's the added value of naturalistic observation? And there I just want to highlight two studies that, that show very clearly that you can get different, different kinds of information, different findings with different methods. So the first one is in the domain of personality. And there um, we want to answer the um, seemingly simple question whether Mexicans um, are more or less sociable than Americans. Um, that should have a fairly straightforward answer, um, and, and people thought that it does. So what you do is you take these big five questionnaires, these personality questionnaires, you make sure that, that, that you handle the, the language issue very well, you translate them, you back translate them, you make sure they're psychometrically the same, and, and once you know all of that, you give them to thousands of people in, 500 American um, participants, 500 Mexican participants. And what you find is that Americans report being more extroverted and more sociable than Mexicans. So in self-report, in people's questionnaires, Americans report being more extroverted and more sociable. This is interesting because when you look at the ethnographic literature, sociability is really a, a core feature of, of extroversion. And I should say, it's also interesting when you travel to Mexico, in fact, before coming to Australia, I, I spent a part of my sabbatical in Mexico, and, and it's a bit of a head scratcher. Um, so why, why is this? And so we decided to do a study together with um, Nairan Ramirez from the University of Connecticut, where we studied um, a small group of, of students from Monterey, Mexico, um, and compared them to another small group of students, 50 students from Austin, Texas. These are not huge sample sizes. These are not the, the thousands of people that you can reach with questionnaires because we need to all hand code it. And of course, you can't really, I mean, these kind of comparisons are tricky. Like Monterey, Mexico is the second largest city in Mexico, and it's in size at the time when we did the study was, was roughly comparable to, to the size of Austin, Texas. We made sure there were two public universities. They were the same age. So we did what we could. But of course, they're not entirely comparable. Nevertheless, um, when we administered the questionnaires, these personality questionnaires, we did replicate um, the, the, the well-established findings that Americans report being more extroverted, more sociable, and more talkative than Mexicans. When we then listened to the sound files, and, and participants were wearing it for a few days, and we coded them, we found interestingly that in terms of the amount of time that the participants spent talking with other people, surrounded by other people, spent socializing, so non-instrumental, fun conversations, and spent talking, we found quite the opposite. And, and then you can say, well, that's not really a fair comparison. You're kind of comparing apples with oranges. Extroversion is a broader construct, and you have all these fine behaviors. But it was really, um, it came to our help that the personality question has one question. I consider myself to be a talkative person. And on that item, American participants reported being more talkative than Mexicans, whereas in our sound files, we found that Mexicans spend about 9% more time talking. So I'm not here to say which one is right, which method is right, and which one is wrong. I find it actually fascinating that how the two, the two go together. Because when participants complete questionnaires, they provide their self-views. They provide their self-concept, how they see themselves. So what we find is that whereas Americans see themselves as more sociable in their self-concepts, Mexicans actually act more sociably on a day-to-day -day basis. So importantly, we can only begin to study these kind of cultural processes when we can separate, when we can tease out self-perception and actual behavior. And when you um, study everything with self-report, then, then you can't. So we, we, we have a methodology to tease apart self-views from daily behavior. A similar, um, we stumble into a similar situation in a different domain, um, the question of gender. I'm not a gender researcher, but, um, um, but we were, we came across um, some research that, that suggested that, um, that 
there's a huge gender differences in the daily word budget, that, that women use about um, 20,000 words a day and, and men use only 7,000 words a day. And importantly, this, this was a book on, on the female brain, um, all of this is, is hardwired into the brains of women and into the brains of men. And so this is interesting. There's a very strong stereotype that women are by a factor more talkative than men. And um, this is interesting, and there's the strongest clear numbers on that, 20,000 versus 7,000. And, and um, you can trace this, this stereotype back, and, and it's very hard to, to, how would you actually go about estimating the number of words unless you have a representative sample of the words that people, people use. And this is where, again, um, this rep representative sampling of situations from ecologies come in, comes in. We knew we had at this point conducted four studies with about 400 participants, and we know we sample 5% of the time, 30 seconds, five times an hour. And then we can count how many words we record, and we can extrapolate from there to, um, to, to the full day. And, and when you do that, this is what you get. These are the, these are the two distributions. And I don't know what captures your attention first. I first saw, wow, this is really interesting. The three most talkative individuals are actually male participants. And, and beyond that, what you see is that there isn't really any difference in the amount of words spoken. So on the, on the left side, you have um, the female participants, on the right side, the male participants. And so here we are at about 17,000 words. Um, or 16,000 words. So these are the exact numbers that we estimated for our participants. So for male participants, we estimated 15,669 words. For female participants, we estimated 16,215 words. So really no difference. Well, you can't really say really no difference. It's actually 500 words more that we estimate for the woman. But this is what you have statistics for. The effect size is trivial and it's not significant, all of these kind of things. But, but we don't need that. We can actually just look what these 500 words are in relation to the differences between people. And to me, I'm also an individual difference researcher, I find this fascinating, the variability that we found in daily word use. We had one participant that over the course of a day spoke an estimated 800 words. That's a long answering machine message in the morning, one at lunchtime, and one in the evening. That's it. We had another person that in the same time spoke 47,000 words. A huge difference, 46,000 words different. And um, without further ado, this is our most talkative participant. They, they tend to make a man, I think, anyways. But um, that's, that's just the kind of stuff that they do. I mean, her mom, it's like they're really nice. Like, some days they're like, super nice and all the loving stuff, and then other days it's like, don't even go in that house. But anyways. So she didn't get to go, she was really upset because she'd always wanted to go there. So I had a surprise here and I made up a lie saying we were going somewhere else. And uh, I was going to take her there. And, and then we got back. So it's interesting. What did the, what did the person talk about? It's very hard to really to grasp it, right? And, and this is how it goes sound file after sound file after sound file. And this is a good reminder to make a shout out to our wonderful research assistants who spend hours and hours and hours transcribing um, the participants. Why is this, I mean, this is, this was actually not the first study um, finding um, overall no difference between men and women in talkativeness, um, but why is this important? This is fascinating because when you give participants a questionnaire, and again, these personality questionnaires with the item, I consider myself to be a talkative person. Consistently, women rate themselves as more talkative than men in the absence of presumably actually talking more. And so this is again interesting. This is. Yet again, not about which one is the best method, which one is the right method, but we have one source that provides us how people see themselves, people self-views, people self-concept. And the self-concept obviously is situated in a culture and, 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 and with all the implicit knowledge about that, that exists about, about the culture. And on the other hand, we have the daily behavior. So we can begin to study daily behavior apart from people's, and in juxtaposition to people's um, self-knowledge. So I wanna, so what we have is we see that, that studying behavior, studying daily behavior, the long way is worth it. It's worth it because it provides or it can provide complementary findings that you could not easily get with other methods. So I wanna use, for the remainder of the talks, I wanna um, highlight three examples where we applied this quotidian perspective to um, a research question. Um, the first research question is, 
and we wanted to know how well-being looks like, or in our case sounds like, from a quotidian perspective. So what is the happy, what is the happy daily life at a conversational level? Is it full of, is it, is it um, shallow, is it conversationally shallow, is it conversationally deep? Um, is it full of superficial happy-go-lucky encounters, and then you have plenty of them, then, then you get um, you, you, you can be happy if you get too deep into all these existential depths, then, then um, you need to worry about it. Or is it that it's the profound social encounters that really make us connect with other people and, and make us happy? So um, we did a first study in collaboration with um, Samin Vazir and a number of other people, and Samin Vazir will be, will be starting here as a faculty member soon. Um, and again, we wanted to know how do, does well-being relate to people's daily social interactions. So we needed to first assess well-being, and there we tried to do um, the best job we could. We, we gave people a, a satisfaction with life measure that gets kind of at the cognitive evaluation of their life. We gave people a questionnaire that asked them, how are you feeling at the moment, so the more emotional aspects of life. And because we're notoriously skeptical of self-report, we also asked participants to give us a few friends, and we asked the friends, hey, how happy do you think your participant really is? And, and we put it all together into a robust index of well-being and then link that to the quantity and quality of people's daily interactions. And what we found was that um, happy people, the happier people were, the less time they spend alone and the more time they spend in interaction. So here, for example, the unhappiest participant had about 20% conversations, the happiest about close to 30. Unhappiest participant, 80% of the time alone. Happiest participant, um, I can't quite see, around 50 probably. Um, so, well-being is robustly related to more quantity of daily social interactions. Um, in terms of quality, we found, interestingly, that it is the deep social encounters that were related to, to well-being. So, um, happy, uh, are happy, the happier participants were, the more time they spend in substantive conversations and the less time in small talk. So for example, here there's a huge difference. This person has about three times as many substantive conversations as, as the person has small talk. Here this person sadly has more small talk than substantive conversations. Um, that was an interesting finding, an important finding, but in the end when you think about it, um, it's okay, but it's in the end really just 96 college students in the US that we were studying and how can we then generalize to how things are in general. Um, several years later, we found ourselves in a position where we had accumulated a lot more data, and we could look at this question again, now with a much larger community sample. So these are um, working adults, um, some with um, uh, just um, some with, with, with illnesses, some, some healthy other samples, but these are community working adults. And um, we, we had a sample of almost 500 people, and with respect to the quantity of social interactions, so now a lot more, we confirmed that well-being was related to spending less time alone and more time with other people. And then these are the statistics, we're not gonna get into statistics, but what's interesting is this is a, a big effect. You can estimate that the difference between the unhappiest person in our sample and the happiest person is about four hours of, of daily conversations. So these are, these are pretty strong effects. Um, we also could revisit the question of the quality of the interactions, where we found that the substantive conversations were related to well-being and small talk uh, did the opposite. And there, interestingly, don't worry too much about all these graphs, but all you need to really look at is those little diamonds down there. You see that this is above zero, so we found a positive effect for for the quality of conversations, the more participants had deep conversations, um, the happier they were. But interestingly, our small talk effect was gone. So um, this diamond crosses zero, so the overall effect size is, is not different from zero. So we failed to replicate our own effect that happiness was negatively related to small talk. That happens. And, and it's good when you, when, you, when you find this. What I think is interesting is when you look at the media coverage to this research, it was actually that the media predominantly jumped on the small talk effect and said, well, small talk is bad for you, small talk is bad for you. So what we can say um, now, having revisited our, our own finding, is that the happy daily life is social rather than solitary. We, we have this well replicated and conversationally um, deep rather than superficial. No, we need to cut that out. But what we can say is that, um, and to me, this is 
this is really among the most interesting findings that every minute seems to count. So if I know nothing about a person other than just the amount of interactions, I have a minor, arguably, but I have a, a grasp of the person's overall well-being. People who, who talk more tend to be happier. And we also tested this for different personality types. We tested whether this is particularly true for extroverts and maybe not so true for introverts. We actually did not find that. So conversationally, introverts and extroverts really seem to run on, this, on, the, on the same fuel. So obviously, behind all these interactions that we cover, there is the interaction with the cashier. There is the interaction with the barista. There is the interaction with the student. There is the argument with the kid. There is um, the, the, the interaction with the doctor. They're very different interactions. And they obviously very, very, they, they matter differently for, for well-being. Nevertheless, the more interactions of any kind, the, the happier the participants were. And of course, the more substantive or deep conversations, good conversations the person had, um, the happier their well-being. So again, from a quotidian perspective, it's the interactions that, that happen on a daily basis that fuel us um, with our well-being. And there's follow-up research also conducted by Jesse Sun and Samin Vazir that, that look at this kind of from a, another angle, the within-person perspective, and they find, they find the same. We then wanted to extend this um, quotidian perspective on well-being to well-being in um, tougher times of life. And so we wanted to look at how um, a quotidian perspective can inform research on, on coping with, with cancer. And um, Hagedon said wonderfully that one fundamental key question that emerges from, from the research that we know on cancer is just how much cancer intrudes upon and organizes the lives of couples confronted with the disease. Direct sampling of the interactions and daily experiences could prove illuminating in this, in this regard, and this is exactly what we wanted to do. We recruited um, cancer patients, breast cancer patients, and their partners. We found 52 couples that were willing to participate in the study, and um, all of the patients were in adjuvant treatment, so in chemotherapy or were receiving radiation. The majority of them were between stage one and three, but we had a few participants that, that had stage four cancer. And um, we recruited them to study. They had to wear the device for one weekend, and then we followed up on them two months later with questionnaires, um, asking them how they're feeling, how they're doing in terms of um, stress, anxiety, well-being, depression, and so, and so on. It was really, it was a wonderful study, because um, I did not know whether participants would be willing to, to wear the device. I mean, it's a pretty sensitive period in, in their lives. And, and, and the last thing I want to do is, is unnecessarily, uh, unduly cause a, an additional burden. But it was very interesting. Um, many of the participants actually donated their compensation back to the project and said, I'm really happy that you care about what happens on a daily basis to us. I mean, this really is, is something that, that we, want, we want to get out. We want to have a voice in this. Um, from my perspective, the study was interesting. So I was a young assistant professor when we did the study. It was my first uh, major study at the University of Arizona. And I was well prepared. I was well set up. And I, I recruited a team of research assistant, assistants. And, and, and I told them, um, these are couples coping with cancer. These are couples where the patient is in treatment. So I think what you can expect is that you will find serious conversations here. And if it gets too intense, please do come to me. We um, can talk about that. We, we can debrief. Um, this is really important. Um, what then happened to me was actually quite a surprise. Um, the first research assistant came back and said, Dr. Mel, had you not told me that this couple is dealing with cancer, I wouldn't have known. Their life seemed so surprisingly normal. And um, I thought, well, this is the first couple. They're probably just an outlier. Let's, let's see. And, and more and more. Uh, research assistant came and, that, and, and shared with me that they were surprised about the degree of, of normal daily life that they were listening to. Um, I do want to say, and I do want to point out, this is in no way in disregard of the fact that cancer obviously is an, uh, a, a very serious illness. And, and despite the fact that the vast majority of our, our um, participants had a good outlook, I have no doubt that this was a major upheaval in their life and that, that there were major consequences. So I, do, I don't take this lightly. But to me, being trained um, as, as a researcher who, who, who looks at emotional disclosure, for example, and the value of the moment, this, this, was, this was very interesting. And it begged the question, how, do you, how should you study this? Should you study this from the perspective of the coping questionnaire, where you confront the participant with questions such as, 
to what extent did you draw on your strengths in coping with cancer? Um, to what extent did you this week, this week talk with other people about the impact of the cancer of your life? To what extent did you discuss with your partner how your partner can support you? So you hone in, you automatically, it's almost impossible not to, you hone in on the cancer experience. And this is valid, and this is valuable, and this is important. But it is, it is one focus, and what the quotidian methods do, they, they, they kind of zoom you out for a while, and they say, well, all of this is true. At the same time, you need to get, um, the, you, food needs to be on the table, the dog needs to go for a walk, the kids need to be driven to school, the kids need to go to the extracurricular activity. All this life still happens. And so this balance, I think, is a really interesting balance that for me um, reshaped how I, how I approached this project. So here, for example, is a random half hour from um, one of our participants. This is the partner of a breast cancer patient. And what you see here, these are the sound file names. This is when it was recorded. These are the transcripts. And then here is like selected coding. So the first file, for example, says, you look like you're deep in thought. And we code, person is um, with another person, is with a significant other, is talking. This is not cancer related. And they're watching TV together. Then nine minutes later, they're still watching TV, no conversation. Nine minutes later, so I bet you're looking forward to having the last treatment on Tuesday. huh? It gets to be a hassle going down there every day and staying there. So this is, again, um, the, the partner talking to, to the breast cancer patient. And um, they're still watching TV. And we would code this. This is obviously cancer related. And we would code this as emotional support. And just about nine minutes later, we, we um, have this. I've never seen such a stupid commercial. Well, it's got a coating on the outside. And you taste that first. And then until that flavor is dissipated, then you get into the other. So to me, the, the beauty is of this method that, that this is like life often puts the existential and, 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 and serious right next to the ordinary humdrum. And to me, this has a lot of beauty. And, and, and this is, I mean, this is said even with a good amount of humor, right? And, and so you get, this is what you can get when you, when you do the kind of daily life methods that, that we've been doing. So what do we find in this study? Um, the, the biggest finding, the biggest aha experience for me was that, on average, 93% of the conversations that the couples had were not about cancer. You can, I mean, looking back, you can say, well, it kind of makes sense, because <laughs> they need to have all these other conversations, right? But I, I must say, as a scientist, as a scientist who's trained in coping research, I incredibly overestimated that number. And, 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 and so it was really interesting. About 20% of the cancer conversations were emotional in nature, um, which is kind of what, what you would expect. You would expect to find those. So here's one, for example, where um, the patient talks to, to, to her spouse and talks about her car that's been in the garage for a while. Get cleaned up. Because I think it will one of these days, so I'm going to drive my car again, go back to work. So this is, this is an emotional conversation, and we find others of them. So one, about one in every five convers cancer conversations were emotional in nature. Some, in fact, were about the afterlife, what would happen in the afterlife. So, so we do get these conversations. Interestingly yet, the majority of cancer conversations were pragmatic and informational in nature. So more than half of the conversations dealt with things such as, well, don't forget on the 4th, I have a CT scan at 3 o'clock. Or, yes, yeah, she said you did need blood work on Monday. Oh, OK. So again, looking back, you may say, well, that makes sense, right? But going forward, I think, when we, when we do a questionnaire approach, we, we stumble over those, those little things in life. Interestingly, the non-conversational conversations were about people, work, leisure, food, home, health, money, religion, pretty much everything, pretty much day in, day out topics, things that, that everybody talks about. And interestingly, these substantive non-cancer conversations or these um, good conversations um, predicted better adjustment. So we can infer from that that ordinary topics characterized the daily conversations of couples coping with breast cancer, even in the midst of an inarguably um, extraordinary time, and they're positively linked to adjustment. We then wanted to switch domain and apply the same um, to, to a different domain, and in this case, uh, we wanted to apply it to the domain of, of children who have had 
a potentially traumatic experience, and this study is the ear, so-called ear four recovery study that we're doing, or we've done in collaboration with um, Professor Alasic and, and several other um, faculty members from here and from Monash University. And in this study, the goal was to understand the role that parent-child conversations play, everyday parent-child conversations play in children's adjustment after injury. Um, we recruited 71 children and their parents into the study, and um, Sharinka is, is here in the room. She was also instrumental for that study and has, has really done a wonderful job um, collecting the data, analyzing the data, and giving perspective to the data. And um, the sample was in a way that so the, the majority of, of, of children um, had either a sports accident or a traffic accident, um, and the majority of them had um, fractures, um, broken bones, soft tissue, tissue injuries. So it, it, was, it was mostly a sample of, of accidents and, and, and um, of various kinds. The uh, children wore the ear for two days um, after they were released from the hospital, and we also administered a number of questionnaires. What did we find? Um, again, interestingly, 89%, so remember it was 93, so really in the same ballpark, 89% of the conversations with a child were not injury-related. There was a lot of variability around that, but some conversations actually never talked about the injury. Some, uh, some families never talked about the injury. Um, just like in the other study, about 20% of the injury conversations were emotional in nature. I found it kind of interesting that the injury talk was um, more emotional than the non-injury talk. So yeah, like when, this is obviously a, um, a topic that parents care about and the kids care about and that, that elicits emotions. But at the same time, it was fascinating to see that um, the injury conversations where you, you talk about the potentially traumatic experience with your child were actually more positive in tone than the conversations that the parents had with the kids otherwise. And again, you may say, well, it kind of makes sense because it's not fun to do homework with the kids. It's not fun to get them to bed, and there's all these things. And so, um, and, and when you talk about the, the traumatic experience, you, you bring with it an attitude of openness and, and caring, right? So it kind of makes sense, but you probably, or I wouldn't have predicted this going into it. So it's a surplus value that you get with the methodology. And again, here, in this case, um, injury talk was, um, particularly direct injury talk, was modestly related to better adjustments. So the more families address the topic, the, the better they were doing. What we need to do here next is we need to analyze what role these 89% um, non-injury conversations play for the, the children's adjustment. Um, consistent with the idea that non-injury conversations do matter, we find that parents who talk more to their children in general, um, so not just about the injury, use a more positive tone in their interactions, and we also find that parents who have a more optimistic outlook um, tend to be more positive in, in their interactions and not just the injury, injury interactions. So ordinary topics also prevail in parent-child interactions even shortly after pediatric injury. And um, clearly their role for adjustment in to a potentially traumatic experience is, is sorely um, underexplored. I did not present you any sound files for this study, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that, um, how would I dare? There is an, um, an, an artist um, put together, to, uh, together with um, Professor Alasic, an audio installation that exactly pursues the purpose of conveying to you, to people, how it is to, how it sounds like um, to be in a family that's affected with trauma. It's a wonderful audio installation that will happen, I'm saying over there, but I, I just know the DAC center is closed, but I don't quite know in which, in which direction. And it will happen there in, in three weeks. And on the 12th of December, there's an introduction by the makers. Um, so the, the, um, the audio artist and, and Eva and, and the other artist, uh, the other scientist that was, was involved in that. Um, so the purpose of this exhibit is very much exactly in the spirit of this quotidian psychology to show how the deep and, and, and the mundane um, can clash together, how the emotional and the practical can clash together, and um, how there is a lot of routine and beauty in the daily life of, of coping with trauma. So taken together, you can compare the two approaches, and you can say, what do they do? We have, on the one hand, a, a life event approach to psychology, and we have, on the other hand, a quotidian perspective. In terms of their focus, they um, differ. 
the life event perspective um, focuses on the nature of critical life events and the consequences of critical life events. The quotidian perspective focuses on everyday experiences and behavior. In terms of methods, the um, life event perspective tends to use longitudinal methods and lab-based methods to exactly establish these trajectories and what is happening, whereas the quotidian method uses daily life research methods, such as the, the ear method, such as experience sampling, other ways of, of getting at the daily experience. The target of the investigation in the life event perspective is the population, establishing the trajectories, and samples of individuals, whereas the target of the quotidian perspective is the individual and the sample of situations. And in their goal, um, life event perspectives tend to focus on trajectories and prediction, whereas quotidian perspective tends to focus on process and explanation and understanding. And the goal would be to bring them both together um, one step closer. So to conclude, both the critical life event perspective and the quotidian perspective are important. They've yielded, um, the, the critical life event has yielded very important knowledge. Um, they just serve different purposes. The quotidian perspective on psychological phenomenon is becoming easier and easier to implement with advances in, in um, mobile technology, smartphones, wearables, Internet of Things that automatically leave digital traces um, of what you're doing on a daily basis. Um, the quotidian perspective um, holds the scientific magnifying glass over the 98% of our lives that you normally just don't see or so easily forget. And it reminds us, um, and to me this is a really interesting way of thinking about it, um, to resist pushing the, the fast, fast forward button in psychological research. What is the fast forward button? Kenneth Craig, remember um, the person who did the live data analysis, follow people with a video camera, when he put um, the tapes into the video recorder and started them, he realized that inherently the, the, the research assistant and him, um, when watching the tape of a person's day, they felt inclined to fast forward, to constantly like, okay, this is, this is not relevant, let's fast forward. When is something interesting happening? And, and then he says, well, this is, this is the point. We need to resist pushing that fast forward button um, to, to allow for these 98% of the lives to, to emerge. And it forces us to think about and conceptualize and theorize about the ordinary mundane experience and behavior, the little the things in life and how they matter for our lives. With that, I want to thank you for um, being here today, for, for um, giving me the space to talk about uh, our research. I want to thank the participants who so readily gave us um, access to their daily lives. I want to thank the incredible research assistants who have been coding um, this work and all the collaborators, and there's more collaborators to that, and the funding agencies. Thank you very much.